Hi, I'm Steve Jaynes, and welcome back to this audio class on how to read the Bible for understanding and power. This is the More Abundant Life Podcast, episode number 367, Supernatural Living, part 4. We're continuing to go through the Old Testament books, looking especially at the supernatural, miracle-working believers as we do an audio outline through the Old Testament. In this episode, we're going to start in the book of Proverbs and continue all the way through to Malachi. Go to Proverbs, the very next book, and we're going to go to verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. And I'm going to ask you a question. Who are the Proverbs written for? Let's see if we can find the answer. It says, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David. Well, we know who wrote them. Of the king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. Hmm. There, so that we can know wisdom and perceive the words of understanding, to receive instruction in wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give uh, subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. It's also it's written to the young man. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall obtain unto wise counsel. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, the fear or the respect or the awe of the Lord is the beginning of what? Knowledge. Knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and, and instruction. See, right here in these verse, first few verses, we know who wrote the Proverbs and what the reason is for. So that we would uh, have the beginning of knowledge. <laughs> Pretty neat, huh? I want to go to the next book in the Bible, Ecclesiastes. And we'll go to verse chapter 1, verse 1. Just to get a little understanding of who it's talking about. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Who's that? Solomon. We know that, right? What does he say? Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanity. All is vanity. Wow. What profit has a man of all his labor which he has taken under the sun? And it goes on. This whole uh, book is about vanity. All the stuff that man does to try to, to be good and to, or to produce something or, or whatever he thinks is wonderful... His conclusion is, it's all vanity. Go to uh, the 12th chapter, verse 13. What we're going to do is get the conclusion to the whole matter. The last two verses of this book, and it says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work unto judgment, Every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So what's the whole duty of man? To, to keep the law, you know, to keep God's word. To know God. To fellowship with God. It's wonderful. The next book is the, the Songs of Solomon. And these are Solomon's songs. Much like you would see in Proverbs were David's songs. Let's go to the next book, Isaiah. Isaiah is where we got a lot of information about God's righteous servant in a, in a previous session, where, we, where Jesus Christ read and saw the things that he would have to do. But I would like to go to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 1. This is where Jesus Christ quoted from when he quoted from Luke. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, 
and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And in Luke, he stops right there. Jesus Christ doesn't read the rest of that verse. He stops right there. Because what it says here, and the vengeance of our God is not what Jesus Christ came to accomplish that year. That's in the future. But you know what it shows you? It shows that Jesus Christ knew how to rightly divide the word. He knew exactly where to stop. He knew what he was called to do, and then he knew what was going to happen later. There is a time coming later when Jesus Christ is coming back on earth. He's going to come back with his saints, and at that time, he is going to be the day of vengeance of our God. And I love that last verse, to comfort all that mourn. But that's the book of Isaiah. We've already spent quite a bit of time in the book of Isaiah in this class. Let's go to Jeremiah. We're going in order here. Jeremiah, we'll go to verse 4, chapter 1. Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came unto me. Jeremiah got a lot of information from God. In one four it says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying... And as you read that, you will see what God gave for revelation to Jeremiah. In verse 11, it says the same type of thing. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, that sayest thou. And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. But the word of the Lord came upon him. And in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, He got the word of the Lord. Jeremiah was speaking the word of the Lord. Now look at chapter 2, verse 13. And it says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now that's a, I think that's a, a meaty verse. A lot's in that verse, in other words. It says, my people. It's talking about God's people. God's people have committed two evils. What are these two evils? Well, they have forsaken God, me, God, the fountain of living waters. Well, you know what a fountain is? It's something that has an everlasting supply of water. So they have forsaken the water of life. The water, they've forsaken God who can quench your thirst all the time, right? But instead... And they viewed themselves out cisterns. You know what cisterns are? They're something that man made. So they don't go, oh, I'll just take the water that God will give me. They go and they work and they make themselves this cistern. They make it out of their hands, right? But look at this cistern. It's broken. You know what a broken cistern is? It's like a, let's take a bucket. It's like a bucket, right, that you made. But it's got a crack in it. What happens when you put water in it? Well, it runs out. It runs out. God's people, the people who love God and want to know God, have done two, they made two evils. One is they've forsaken the good water that never ends, and they went and by their works made out a cistern that can hold no water. And you know what? If you're in a desert and you've got a broken cistern, you have no water. If you're in a desert, you have God, you got water. It's pretty neat. That's some of the stuff that uh, Jeremiah was doing. I want to go to 15, 16, because I love this stuff. But see, later as you're working God's Word, as you're reading God's Word, you can go back and read some of these records, the entire record, because you have your whole life to do this. You don't have this short time in this class. You have your whole life to, to read God's Word. I look at it like this. There's really two times that you can work God's Word or to read God's Word. One is when you, you need to find an answer. So you're, you're really looking for an answer. And God will help you to find that answer. No problem there. The other is just for enjoyment. You just want to sit down, pick up God's Word, and start reading. Read some of these records in the Old Testament. See what those believers in the Old Testament did. And the things that they had. You'll see that they're, they're not so different than we are. They had opportunities. They had problems. They, were, they were, had things that would stop them from looking to God. They had things that would help them to look towards God. They would believe God. They wouldn't believe God. But you can see the lessons that are there. You could see men with Holy Spirit and what they accomplished with it. 
So reading God's word is our contact point with God. We need to spend much time thinking about God's word, putting it on in our mind. In this class, I'm just trying to get a framework so that you could have God's word, start reading it, and start understanding it so that you can understand it and also to walk with great power. But look what happened here in Jeremiah 15:16. It says here, Thy words were found. See, they were lost. Jer they were lost in the rubble of the temple. And Jeremiah dug through the rubble. He found the word and he did eat them. It doesn't mean he had a barbecue. It means that he assimilated it. He read it. He tried to understand it. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. It was the joy and the rejoicing. He just got blessed the second time he read it. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. He got blessed as he read that word. And, man, we get to read a lot of God's word. In our country and the countries around the world, there are Bibles everywhere. You never have to ask anybody if they can get a Bible. I'm serious. I never go, you having a hard time finding a Bible? No one's having a hard time finding a Bible. They're around. I had a friend of mine who went to uh, prison. I mean, he went to jail. He says, when you're in jail, he says, you can't get nothing. You can't get a, something to shave with. can't get soap. can't get shampoo. You can't get a towel. You ask for a Bible, it's there in a second. There's always someone ready to give you a Bible. But it's not just having it. We've got to read it and rejoice with this Bible. We should spend time with it because when we're reading God's Word, it's our contact point with God. These are words of God for us. They're great words. The next book that you would come across is Lamentation. And this is Jeremiah. and He's lamenting that Israel would not come back to God's Word. So he's doing what I'm doing. He's saying, God's word's great. You've got to listen to God's word. But Israel as a country wouldn't go back to God's word. So he's lamenting that. The book of Ezekiel is the exhortation to repent and the rejection of Jerusalem. In other words, they just rejected God's word. And then you come to the book of Daniel. And remember Joseph and his dream? Well, this king, Nebuchadnezzar, in the book of Daniel, had a dream. And he had one of those dreams, the same idea. He woke up all shook up about the dream. And he got calls in all his guys, his cabinet, his magicians, his hooky-pook artist. And he says, I, I just had this dream and it scared the crap out of me. And I want you to tell me the interpretation of the dream. And they said, okay, what's the dream? He says, I forgot the dream. That's exactly. Read Daniel. He says, I forgot the dream, but I want to know the interpretation of it. And they said, if we don't even have the dream, how can we interpret it? He says, I want the dream. Our heads are going to fall. He's the king, Nebuchadnezzar. You know what? Daniel comes along and says, I can tell you the dream and the interpretation because God will share it to me. And he did just that. And when he did that, uh, Nebuchadnezzar made Daniel second in command of the Babylon Empire. A child of God who was in captivity. He was in captivity. And then he had these other guys. In Daniel uh, chapter 3, there's a record of uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I'm not going to read that right now. But there's a record of, of these three men who would not bow to King Nebuchadnezzar's statue that he made, I exhort that you read this record. But they wouldn't bow to it. And he says, if you don't bow to it, I'm going to throw you into a, a, into a furnace of fire. I'm going to make that fire seven times hotter than it should be. And I'm going to throw you in there if you don't bow to my statue. These three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, says, we're not going to bow. And our God is able to deliver us. And even if he isn't able, we're still not going to bow. And the king got so mad, it says that his visage changed. His skin was popping out of his face. Veins were just... And he, and he, and he called the three 
most mightiest men in this kingdom to tie these guys up. And they tied them up in their clothes and the hosenly and everything else. And he says, throw them in there. And these three, three men, these three, like it's like Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and two other guys just as big. <laughs> and uh, took them and threw these three men. And the fire was so hot that those men died. And then the king is looking in. You know what he's seeing? He sees these guys walking around. And then he goes, uh, Hey, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you guys come out? They came out. And he goes, No, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. You know what? The, it says in the Bible there wasn't even the smell of smoke on them. The fire was so hot that the men that threw them in got licked up with it. And Nebuchadnezzar goes, your God's a good God. Your God's a good God. Pretty wild story. It's not a story. It's a record. It's true. It really happened. Because these men had such great confidence and faith in God. And God said, if they don't bow, I'm going to protect them. And God did. Then in, da in, in Daniel in chapter 6, we're not going to go there, but it's the record of Daniel in the lion's den. And this is later in Daniel's life. He's an older man. And they made a law, you know. The law was, if anyone prayed to anyone else besides their king, you got thrown in the den of lions. So Daniel, three times a day, went right, he went right out to the window where everybody could see him, and he prayed. It's a really great record, Jerry. The king was so sorry that he made this law. It was one of those ones they, they, they snuck in late at night. They made it sound like, oh, king... We got everybody's got to go to you for everything. We everyone's going to go for you for everything. And he goes, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, you know, kings like that. So he said, yeah, I'll make that a law. And then he found out that his buddy Daniel prayed to God three times a day that he was going to have to throw him in the in the den of lions, and he didn't want to do it, but he had to because he just made this law. So the king says, I don't really want to do this, Daniel, but I have to. Oh, your God better be big enough. Daniel says, Yeah, my God's big enough. Don't worry. But uh, Daniel's an old man by this time. An older man. Can you imagine taking an old man, just throwing him into a hole in the ground? He'd probably get hurt just from that. But they threw him in the den of lions. And the king could hardly sleep that whole night. That next morning, first thing in the morning, he bounces out and he goes over to the mouth of the den of lions and he goes, Daniel, you, you all right? Daniel says, yeah, I'm fine. You get me out of here. So they pull Daniel out. And uh, the king says, okay, all you guys that made this law, your turn. And they took them and they threw them in the lion's den. And their whole families. And it says that they never even hit the ground before the lions got them. They were just falling through the air. And the lion goes, coo -coo, coo -coo, coo -coo. they never touched Daniel. Miracle. we got to believe that God takes care of us. Daniel just said, hey, my God will take care of me. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, yeah, my God will take care of me. The king has this dream, and he can't even tell you what the dream is. And Daniel says, my God will give you the answer. And he'll tell you the dream, too. That's, even, that's tougher than Joseph's dream. He didn't even know the dream. Our God is so big, so wonderful, so powerful. The next book you'd come across is the book of Hosea. He uses his own marital experience as his wife left him to go with other men and Israel left the Lord to go after other gods. He compares the two things and how hurtful they are. But let's go to Hosea right after Daniel chapter 4. I've already gone by it. I got, I'll tell you one thing that really helps us to know the books of the Bible. Uh, Hosea 4, 6. And it says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Now let's just stop there for a second. It says, My people. Once again, it's God's people. People who love God. They are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Now this knowledge can't be the latest uh, things that are happening in Hollywood. Because we know all about that, right? So... It can't be the latest sports events that's going on. It can't be the latest news of the war. It can't be the latest news of any kind, right? 
this lack of knowledge has to be the lack of the knowledge of God's word. It has to be that. That's what destroys people. They don't know God's word to the point that they can walk with confidence and trust in God to live prosperously, to have an abundant life, to be blessed, to have all those things that are, that's written in God's word for, for us to have. He says, but my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forsaken the law of God, I will also forsake thy children. And this is Hosea once again talking about, he's talking about his own experience with his wife that, that left him to go with other men. And he uses that comparison of Israel leaving God to go after other gods. Pretty wild, huh? Let's go to the next book is Joel. Now, Joel, we've read some of Joel and Peter. Remember in uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 17, Peter on the day of Pentecost quoted this verse and, and, and it talks about Holy Spirit being available to all people everywhere. And I'm just going to read it. Chapter 2, 28. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. See, every all mankind will be able to have his spirit. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Pretty cool, huh? And your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon thy handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. See, Peter quoted this verse in that first sermon on the day of Pentecost. How, once again, Holy Spirit was now going to be available to all people everywhere. In the Old Testament, it was just on a relatively few people. Remember that? Just a few people had it. And then the next book we come across to is Amos. Amos was a herdsman who received valuable information from God. And then the next book in the Bible is Obadiah, who got a vision from the Lord God. And this is only one chapter long. I think it's only like 21 verses long. And then we come to Jonah. Let's read a little bit of Jonah. Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. And this book is only four chapters long. You could read this in uh, 10 or 15 minutes before you go to work in the morning and get valuable information from God that you could use throughout your day. But here's Jonah. He's, he's a fun one to read about. He says in verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the, the son of Imate, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went unto Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down unto it to go with them to Tashkis from the presence of the Lord. Can you see what's going on here? God is saying, hey Jonah, go to Nineveh and cry against that city because of the wickedness before me. And he goes, no. And he goes the other direction. Nineveh's up here. He says, and he goes, I, he went from the presence of the Lord. He got under this ship. And he's saying, I'm not going there. You know why? Because he knew that if the, they repented, that God would save them. And he didn't want them to be saved. Can you imagine that? That's like God saying, hey, you, you go over and save these people. I'll you know, give them my word, and if they believe it, they'll get saved. You say, no, I'm, I don't like those people. I'm not going <laughs> to give it to them. That's exactly what he did. So he gets in the ship, and he goes in the other direction. That's a character. Now that's a character. That's a fun one to read. And you can see what happens. He's in the ship and the ship gets tossed to and fro and, and every, everyone thinks they're going to die. And Jonah says, hey, it's my fault. I'm not, I'm not doing what God wanted me to do. The only way that you're going to be saved is to throw me in the ocean. And they don't want to throw him in the ocean, but the, it gets so rough they finally decide to throw him in the ocean. So they take Jonah and they throw him in the ocean. And it says a great fish swallows him up. And then it, uh, this is gross, but it, it pukes them up on the shore. 
uh, you know, not of Nineveh, just on the shore. And uh, I'll show you that in uh, chapter 3. Well, uh, let's go to chapter 2, verse 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Ah, I bet he smelled. <laughs> All right, now chapter 3. I mean, you get the full picture. God tells him to go. He, he goes the other way. Fish takes him, throws him up, <laughs> vomits him onto the shore. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. And Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and, and said, Yet for forty days Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh, what? Believe God. He got to the city, started telling them what God told them to tell, and they believed God, and the proclamation, a fast, and they put sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. And the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him in, with sackcloth, and laid in ashes. Do you know, this putting on sackcloth and laying that, that's a sign of humility. So, Jonah starts, it's a three days journey, he gets one journey, one day's journey in, and the whole city is repenting. They're going, oh, we blew it, and they're sitting in sackcloth, and in ashes, saying, oh, we, we want to believe God. We want to believe God. Look at verse 7. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and the noble saying, let neither man nor beast, herbs or flocks taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from his violence that is in his hand. Who can tell if God w will turn and repent and turn away from this fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And, the re and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. And so this is exactly what Jonah was afraid of. Jonah was afraid that if he went there and, and cried unto Nineveh, and he didn't like Nineveh, that they would repent, and he, didn't want, he wanted God to give it to him. He didn't want them to repent. He was bummed out about this. Bummed out. And look at, look at verse 1 of chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was what? Very angry. Can I, this is such a wild story to figure out. But, but Jonah goes, I'm mad that God's taking care of those people. I knew he'd do it. I didn't want to go do it, and I did it. And look what happened. They all changed their minds. He's just mad. But I guess it's better than being in a fish. But I just want to go through the rest of the Old Testament Micah describes the beauty and the righteousness which should and someday would exist. Naaman is, is a prophet that was much like Jonah against Nineveh, but this time they did not repent. They didn't repent. Habakkuk is written as a conversation between Habakkuk and God. Habakkuk asked God questions, and God answered them. That's a fun one to read sometime when you get a chance. Nephariah prophesied in the early years of King Josiah's reign in Jerusalem. The word of God helped the God-believing King Josiah to thoroughly purge of the uh, Judah's idolatry. They had a lot of idolatry. King, you can read about this in the book of uh, in the books of Kings. But Josiah, he just got rid of all their idols there. Haggai was among the Judeans who returned to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity, and he urged the rebuilding of the temple as their highest priority. And the next book of Zephariah joined Haggai in urging the returned exiles to the rebuilding of the temple. 
when they got out of that exile in Babylon at captivity, they wanted them to rebuild the temple, to get that temple built. In the Old Testament, the temple was made of bricks and stone. In our administration, what is the temple built of? Does anyone know? It is made of us. We're the temple. All the believers collectively are the temple. And we rebuild the temple every day as we let people know about God and they can become part of the temple. Every bit piece being built. It's pretty neat, huh? And uh, the last book in the uh, Old Testament is Malachi. The last prophet before John the Baptist, he proclaimed a warning to the priest, telling them to get back on the job. They weren't doing a very good job of being priests, including how they were mishandling the tithes and offerings. And I have to read Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, verse 7. I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers are ye gone away from my ordinances, and have not kept the return unto me, and I will return unto you, said the Lord of hosts. But ye say, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse. Ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be enough room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Look what God will do for us. He says, you, you give me the tithes, right, and this is what I'm going to do for you. He says, I'm going to open up the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing that there's not enough room to receive it. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. What kind of insurance could you buy anywhere that would do that? And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, said the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, and ye shall be a delightful some land, said the Lord of hosts. And that ends the records before the the next prophet, which would be John the Baptist, which you can read in the gospel period. And that ends this session of our our class. But one of the things I did want to really emphasize as we go through this, that we have Holy Spirit. Everything that you see that any of these believers can do, we can do. Like we can have the strength of Samson. We can have the wisdom of Solomon. We can have the courage of Joshua. We can have the all anything that you see a believer have with the Holy Spirit, we have today and more. And we can operate those in our lives. We do we are truly supernatural human beings. We just gotta learn how to be able to manifest that so that we can be blessed and other people can be blessed also. Thank you. In the next sessions, as we continue, we're going to look more at how to operate the Spirit of God so that we can be miracle-working believers also and help ourselves and others that will hear us.